Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya <coughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Janvarasya Yatan Vyat Itaritas Charte Suan Vidyasurat Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaya Maya Vimuyanti Yatsure Tejo Varimidam Yatavini Mayo Yatarti Sargumisha Damna Svena Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimahi Shimad Bhagavatam Grantaraj Ki Jai Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Nama Om Vishnu Pradaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutali Sumati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Dhanamani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gurubhani Vichara Nirvisay Sasuni Vali Paskati Lissatani Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Sri Vaita Gadadha Sri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vinam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Bo Anyone there? What? Okay. <coughs> huh? Hare Krishna. I received the homework today from, let me check, and make sure I have the list. I have stressed. Uh, I have Sanmuk. And there is Anamika, I mean Augustia and Krishna. Suniti, Prabhulika, and Sritan. Good. So I think today we're going to look at uh, Suniti and Prabhulika, Krishna, and Gosanmuk. Okay, let's start with Sanmuk. So, Sanmuk says, read Srimad Bhagavatam 2934 and the purport, and then explain the difference between reality and illusion. Use the snake and the rope example to answer the question. How do we decide if something is illusion or real? Sanmuk writes, the criterion to decide something as real or illusion or false is based on its relation to Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam 2934 states, O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value if it is without relation to me has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. And Sanmuk writes, therefore, if something is used in the service of the Lord, it is considered as real. And if it is not, then it is considered to be an illusion. Now, a question may arise regarding why should anything Considered in a, uh, why should anything, what? Hmm. Something missing here. Anyway, why should any, no. Why anything should be considered in relation to Krishna? Is that what you want to say? I'm, I'm adding the word be. There's no, it says, why should, why anything should considered in relation to Krishna? Hmm. Okay, I don't know 
exactly what he's trying to say, but let's see what he explains. This is explained by Prabhupada in the purport, Srimad Bhagavatam 1.1.1. Prabhupada writes, Beginning from Brahma down to the insignificant ant, no one is independent in the material world, creation. The hand of the Lord is seen everywhere. All material elements, as well as all spiritual sparks, emanate from him only. Conditioned souls, beginning from Brahma, who engineers the entire universe, down to the insignificant ant, are all created, creating, are all created, I guess. Again, there's a mistake here. Are all created, but none of them is independent of the Supreme Lord. The materialist wrongly thinks that there is no creator other than his own self. This is called maya, or illusion. This tells us that nothing is independent of the Lord. Okay, that's correct. And when one, due to their lack of knowledge, thinks that everything is independent of the Lord, it is an illusion. Okay. This tells us that nothing is independent of the Lord, and when one, due to their lack of knowledge, thinks that everything is independent of the Lord, it is illusion. Nothing in the material world is greater than the Lord, and at the same time, nothing is independent from Krishna. For example, a car can be produced when there is a need of human beings. When there's, there's a need for it by human beings. And the intelligence to do anything is given by Krishna. And his example, neither the car nor the human being is greater than the Lord and neither are they independent of Krishna. Okay, well, let's see here. Okay, we'll leave that. We'll go on. Let's see what else you have to say. What is real and what is an illusion? Okay, basically what you've said here in the first paragraph, is nothing is independent of the Lord. Okay. And everything is lit made with the Lord's energy. So... Therefore, if someone thinks that uh, there is uh, total independence from the Lord, it's an illusory idea. If someone thinks that there is no Lord, no God, that's another illusory idea. Okay, next. What is real and what is an illusion? According to information from above, for something to be considered as real, it must be permanent. It must be used in the service of Lord Krishna to become permanent. Everything in the material world is temporary, but that can be changed by using it in the service of the Lord. One who knows that everything can be used in the service of the Lord is considered a Mahatma or a great soul. Knowledge of accepting everything in relation to the Lord is real, but the knowledge of the Big Bang, the evolution theory, is completely an illusion. The conclusion of dovetailing everything in relation to the Lord is known as yoga maya, or the energy of union, and the wrong conception of detaching a thing from its relationship with the Lord is called the Lord's daivi maya, or or, or divinely inspired illusion, I guess you could say that. Misconceiving one thing for another thing is called illusion. An example is of accepting a rope for a snake or vice versa. The rope is present, but the acceptance of the rope as a snake is an illusion. Therefore, anything which is not related to Krishna is illusion. The concept of illusion is explained in the purport to Srimad Bhagavatam 9, 2, 9.34. One can easily be illusion due to their poor fund of knowledge. The examples are of scientists, philosophers, mayavadis, etc. 
These people are amazed by the creation or emanations of the Lord, but not the Lord, such as the scientists who are amazed by the sun, moon, nature, and the Mayavadis who are bewildered by the Brahma Jyoti, or the effulgence of the Lord. In the purport, it also states that the illusory energy has two phases. These are the strong influence in this phase, the living entity is thrown into the darkness of ignorance and has very little chance of understanding Krishna. And the covering influence in this phase, the living entity is covered by being given a poor fund of knowledge about existence of God. When one surrenders unto the Lord and performs devotional service, then by the mercy of the Lord, one can understand Krishna and understand all the misconceptions he has. A pure devotee knows to accept everything in favor to Krishna and reject anything that is not in favor to Krishna. In conclusion, the absolute principle by which one can identify something as real or illusion is by its relationship with Krishna or to Krishna. Okay. Explain how you can practically use the verse Srimad Bhagavatam 2934 to determine what is real and how what is and and what is illusion and give some examples. Okay, Sunmuk writes, anything related to Krishna is real, and if something is not related to Krishna, it is known as an illusion. Whatever opulences, fame, wealth, beauty, etc acquired in the material world will come to an end at the time of death, whereas the spiritual knowledge and at the devotional service, uh, de whereas the spiritual knowledge at the time of death It says, anything acquired, whatever opulences, fame, wealth, beauty, etc., acquired in the material world will come to an end at the time of death. Okay. Whereas the spiritual knowledge, devotional service continues. This is affirmed by Krishna Bhagavad Gita 644. Where it says, Purva bya sen atenaiva hidyate hi avasopisa jigyasur apiyogasya sabda brahmativartate. Bhagavad Gita 6.44. By virtue of the divine consciousness of his previous life, he automatically becomes att attracted to the yogic principles, even without seeking them. Such an inquisitive transcendentalist stands always above the ritualistic principles of the scriptures. An example is Haridas Thakur and King Bharata. Haridas Thakur was born in a Muslim family. He was elevated to position of Namacharya by Lord Chaitanya. King Bharata was the emperor of the world and he renounced at a young age, he renounced his kingdom at a young age to perform austerity, but he failed. And therefore in his next life, he was born in the family of Brahmana and continued to perform austerities. And at the end of his life, he went back to Godhead. Well, it wasn't his next life. It was his next life he became a deer, but then after that he became the son of a brahmana. By virtue of the divine consciousness of his previous life, he automatically becomes attracted to yogic principles, even without seeking them. Such an inquisitive transcendentalist stands always above the ritualistic principles of the scriptures. That's another verse. Uh, no, that's the verse, yeah. So he says, one should be regulated in the process of chanting, hearing glories of Krishna, attending Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam classes, etc. Okay, well, some good try. It's a little bit muddled, but uh, you got the general idea. Um, let me see if I can add a little clarity to this. The first question is that you want to read 2.9.34 and its purport and then explain the difference between reality and illusion. Okay, first 
let's go to first principles. First principle is Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. And he's the source of everything material and spiritual. That's point one. That's aham sarvasya prabhavo matak sarvam paratate iti bhatma pajante mam buddha bhava saman bitaha. Okay, it's Bhagavad Gita 10.8. So he's the source of everything material and spiritual. It's a very important point. And now there's more evidence in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, for example, verse number 7. Seven seven. Uh, seven six. Itad yoni ni butani. So first one was ten eight. Now second one. Itad yoni ni butani. Sarvani tu padaraya. Ham Krishna shyajagata. Prabhava palayastata. All created beings have their source in these two natures, meaning uh, the. Prakriti, uh, para prakriti and apara prakriti. The superior energy of the Lord and the inferior spiritual energy of the Lord. Of all that is material and all that is spiritual in this world, know for certain that I am both the origin and the dissolution. Okay. And Prabhupada writes, everything's a product of matter and spirit. Spirit is the basic field of creation, and matter is created by spirit. Spirit is not created at a certain stage of material development. Rather, this material world is manifested only on the basis of spiritual energy. And then this material body is developed because of spirit, or soul, is present within matter. A child grows gradually to boyhood and then to manhood because that superior energy, spirit, soul is present. Similarly, the entire cosmic manifestation of the gigantic universe is developed because of the presence of the super soul, Vishnu. Therefore, spirit and matter, which combine to manifest this gigantic universal form, are originally two energies of the Lord, and consequently, the Lord is the or original cause of everything. Okay, so that's 7.6. And Krishna is the, sup uh, the supreme is the cause of both the big and small souls. So big would be like Vishnu expansions, and small would be you and me. And Krishna, the supreme, is the cause of both the big and small souls. Therefore, he is the original cause of all causes. This is confirmed in the Kata Upanishad 2.2.13, Nityo Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam. So that's an important verse too, Kata Upanishad. 2.2.13. And what's the main difference between Krishna, the Supreme Soul, and all other souls? He supplies all others with their sustenance or food. That's the difference. Okay, and then 7.7 seven says, Matak paratanam nanyat kinchidasti dananjaya mai sarvamidam protam sutre manigana ivan. O conqueror of wealth, there's no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. So this also, very important verse. So we, we have 10.8, 7.6, and 7.7. These are explaining fundamental principles about Krishna. So anything you see is made of spirit and matter. And Krishna is the origin of both material and spiritual things. So therefore, Krishna is everything. But yet he is an independent individual. Okay, so that's very important. Next, that is that Krishna not only expands everything, He's also present in everything personally. Maya tatam bidam sarvam jagat avyakta mutina matstani sarvabhutani na chaham te suvastita. This is 9.4. 9.4. 
and it says that Krishna is present in, in the heart of every individual and he's also present in every atom of the universe. So nothing is independent of the Lord. Okay. And then and then it says Nachamatstani mm, Bhutani Pashime Yogam Aishwaryam Bhutabri Nachabhutasto Mamatma Bhutta Bhavana. This is nine five. Krishna says, and yet everything that is created does not rest in me. Behold my mystic opulence. Although I am the maintainer of all living entities, and although I am everywhere, I am not a part of this cosmic manifestation, for myself is the very source of creation. So that this basically these two verses establish that number one, nine four Krishna is present in the heart of every living entity and in every atom of the universe, and therefore everything works in a synchronized way in nature. And number two, although he's present in every atom, every every uh, in the heart of every living entity, he's also independent, engaged in his own transcendental pastimes in the spiritual world. So, uh, although he's He's the maintainer of all living entities. He's present everywhere. At the same time, he's not part of this cosmic manifestation or the material manifestation because he is the source and everything is being uh, created, maintained, and annihilated by his expansions. The first and second expansions the Narayan expansion in the spiritual world and the Vishnu expansions in the material world. Okay. And then, uh, so then it says, 9.13, Mahatmanas tu mamparta daivim pakriti masritaha bhajanti ananyamana so gadva buddhadim avyayam. O Sanaprita, those who are not deluded, the great souls, are under the protection of the divine nature. They are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, original and inexhaustible. So the Mahatmas are never in illusion in the material world because they know that Krishna is the origin of everything. Krishna is present in everything. Krishna is also independent and engages in his own pastimes the spiritual world with his devotees without being influenced by the modes of material nature, time, etc. So, therefore, the devotees or Mahatmas, they're not in illusion. They know these things. 10 8, 7 6, 7 7, and 9. Uh, nine four nine five, and then nine thirteen. Okay, so all these verses help us to understand that Krishna is in a very special position, unique position. No one is equal to or greater than him, and uh, he's transcendental to the modes of material nature. And it's only by knowing him that one becomes liberated and enga by engaging in his service. There's no way someone can get liberated other than through knowledge of Krishna and devotional service to the Lord. There's no truth, truth superior to him. He, is, he possesses all opulences, beauty, fame, knowledge, power, and renunciation, so forth, wealth. He's bigger than the biggest, smaller than the smallest. And so these are the type of verses that you would use to establish the unique position of Krishna. Okay, and then the Kata Upanishad 2.2 point, what is it? 2.2.1. Where it says uh, that what differentiates Krishna from all the living entities is the fact that he 
is supplying or he's nutrying or, or, or he is he is the source of food for everyone else he is the source of energy the source of food source of everything for every everyone else so that differentiates him from all other living entities okay now when what is the symptom of mahatma he never deviates his attention to anything outside Krishna, because he knows perfectly well that Krishna is the original pers supreme person, the cause of all causes. And there's no doubt about it. And such a Mahatma develops through association with other Mahatmas, or pure devotees. The pure devotees are uniquely dedicated to Krishna and his two-armed form as Shamsundra the same form that Arjuna saw on the battlefield of Kurukshetra and who was driving his chariot. Okay. And the, the other thing that defines the Mahatma, Satatam kirtiyam tamam jatantas chadjuturata namansyantas chamam bhakta niti yukta upasate. That is, that the uh, the pure devotees or the Mahatmas are always chanting Krishna's glories, his name, his pastimes, and so forth, and always bowing down, always engaged in the alert service of the Lord with determination, and uh, they always worship him. Okay, so if you have this background of knowledge about Krishna, who is Sarvakarana Karanam, the cause of all causes. There's no other cause beyond him. Uh, and therefore, Ishwara Parama Krishna is the supreme Ishwara or controller. Satchitananda Vigra has a transcendental body made of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. It's not like our body. Sarvakarana Karanam. And then. Uh, such a tenanda vigraha. Anadi Adi. He has no beginning and he's the original person. And Sarvakarana Karanam, he's the cause of all causes. So with that background, one can understand this verse more deeply. That whatever appears to be of any value. If it has, if it is without relation to Krishna, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that, re that reflection which appears to be in the darkness. So, you can take anything. You can take the theory of evolution by Darwin. You can take the Big Bang theory by some speculative uh, scientist. You can take uh, the timeline of history of the world of the Christians. They, they are saying the world started 5,000 years ago. That's completely wrong. It's not what Krishna says. And then the scientists say, oh, it started maybe, you know, uh, 50 billion years ago. That's also wrong. It's not what Krishna says. How could, how could the world only be 50 uh, million years ago when Krishna, uh, uh, Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, the Vivas, one hundred twenty million years ago, right. and he spoke to Brahma in the beginning of creation. Over eight trillion years ago. So how can you say that things only started five thousand years ago or fifty million years ago? These are all bogus statements. So. When we look at something, and like for example, when you go to school, they're teaching you th that whatever they're teaching you is minus Krishna. So anything minus Krishna is an illusion. So everything they're teaching you is basically illusory. Illusory doesn't mean it lacks existence. It simply means that you're accepting it to be something that it is not. 
and never was. Therefore, they tell you in school, it's okay that you have your religion. That's your belief. And if that makes you feel good, that's okay. You can have your own belief. But that's not science. That, is, th that there is a false statement. They're, they're trying to make you think that religion is a feel-good uh, belief that has no basis in science. Well, that's not true. Any religion that accepts that there's a supreme God who's the creator of everything, the source of everything, that's the truth. Any uh, statement that God uh, is a personal belief that you may have, but belief in God is not scientific, therefore we don't discuss it. That is not true. Uh, how do we know that? Well, because of these verses that we just read and discussed a little bit. And when you misconceive one thing for another thing, it's called delusion, such as thinking a rope in the dark is a snake. Now, the rope does exist. That's a fact. But believing it's a snake is an illusion. And what is an illusion? It's accepting one thing to be something else that it is not and never was. Was the rope ever a snake? No. So <laughs> that's an illusion. So you believe the rope to be something that it never was. And if you act on it and become afraid and start running away or something like that, then, then you're, in a, you're, in, you're in a delusional state, delusional state. In other words, not only you're in illusion, but now you're in delusion. You're acting as if the illusion is real. And basically, that's crazy or a type of craziness. Just like people think that sense gratification is the goal of life. So basically, they've gone crazy. They, they have parties and they do uh, uh, barbecues and they're barbecuing cow meat and pig and, and fish and other things and they're drinking liquor and also they're engaging in illicit activities and they're acting foolishly talking nonsense and they call that fun well it's not fun it's condemnation by the laws of karma they're engaging in sinful activity and it just causes suffering. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know from, for example, the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, 22nd verse. It says, it says, But quotes Shimad Bhagavatam 5.5.1. Nayam deho deha bhajam nri loke. Kastan kamam arhate vid bhujam ye. Tapo divyam putrika yena satvam. Sudayet yasmat vamasokam twanantam. So that's fifth, can fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, verse number 22 in the purport. He's quoting. This verse from Srimad Bhagavatam by Bharat Maharaj in 5.5.1. And he says, My dear sons, Bharat Maharaj is speaking to his sons, there's no reason, no reason to labor very hard for sense pleasure while in this human form of life. Such pleasures are available to the stool eaters, meaning hogs. Rather, you should undergo penances in this life by which your existence will be purified. And as a result, you will be able to enjoy unlimited transcendental bliss. Okay, now this is a very important verse. Basically, it's saying, just like you should not work hard for sense gratification. You should not even try for sense gratification. Because 
you're allotted some sense gratification based on your previous karma, and you're allotted some uh, suffering based on your previous karma. You don't have to be, you, don't, you don't have to work to attain the good results, and you don't have to. And there's nothing you can do to protect yourself from the bad results. Therefore, you should try and use this life, you know, the energy you have, the consciousness you have, the intelligence you have, to develop Krishna consciousness. I didn't know. Rather than to develop wealth or to develop prestige or to develop uh, a lot of sense gratification. <coughs> and so rather you should undergo penances in this life by which your existence will be purified. So, then it says, therefore, those who are true yogis or learned transcendentalists are not attracted by sense pleasures, <coughs> which are the causes of continuous material existence. The more one is addicted to material pleasures, the more he is entrapped by material miseries. So there you are. That's the law of nature. The more one is addicted to material pleasures, the more he is entrapped by material miseries. So, this is an extremely important verse. I mean, this, yeah, the, I mean, the verse and, and purport, the purport to 522 is extremely important. It explains what the law of material nature is. The more we try for material pleasure, the more we will be, we will, we will suffer. But the more we try for spiritual purification, the less we suffer and the more we feel happy and satisfied that we're actually using our time and energy correctly. And Krishna rewards us. Krishna rewards us in several ways. One, he protects us so we can continue in devotional service. And two, he gives us knowledge by which we come closer to him. So, he rewards us in those two ways. He says, Kuntiya Pratijani Hinami Bhakta Pranasyati. My devotee will never perish. Ninth chapter, what is it, 28th or 29th verse? Let's see. Now it's 20, 31st verse. Right. And then he says, 10th chapter, Uh, tenth verse, te sam satta yukta nam bhajitam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam uta bhayanti dehe. Those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, I give the understanding by which they come to me. So you get two rewards by uh, using this life for purification through penance or austerity. In other words, denying yourself sense gratification and therefore you become rewarded, one, with knowledge of Krishna by which you come closer to him and two, protection by Krishna so that you continue in devotional service. Or another, uh, another two words for this is yoga and shema. Yoga means Krishna makes Krishna consciousness very easy uh, uh, to access, to engage in. And two, he uh, protects you from falling down. Okay. All this, of course, depends on having a bona fide spiritual master and masters, Shikshan Diksha Gurus, and their association. And he says... A person may have a bona fide spiritual master and may be attached to a spiritual organization, but still, if he is not intelligent enough to make progress, then Krishna from within gives him instructions so that he may ultimately come to him without difficulty. This is 10th chapter, Bhagavad Gita, 10th verse in the purport. The qualification is that a person always engage himself in Krishna consciousness and with love and devotion render all kinds of services. He should perform some sort of work for Krishna, and that work should be with love. If a devotee is not intelligent enough to make progress on the path 
of self-realization, but is sincere and devoted to the activities of devotional service, the Lord go, gives him a chance to make progress and ultimately attain to him. Okay. So, we just went through a whole bunch of verses, Bhagavad Gita, one to establish the uh, truth about Krishna as the Supreme Personality Godhead, no one is equal or greater than him. Everything emanates from him, everything material and spiritual emanates from him, therefore nothing is independent of him because everything is made of his energy. Even illusory things are coming from him. Yes, like for example, because of uh, temperature on a hot day on an asphalt road, you'll see a mirage. Well, th that's and it's due to refraction of the sunlight on on the hot asphalt. Well, that whole principle of refraction of sunlight is based on Krishna. Krishna is the origin of light of the sun. So even an illusion on a asphalt road or, or some kind of road in the summertime where there's a lot of heat depends on Krishna. So both the reality and the illusion depends on Krishna. Krishna gives you uh, limited senses. Because of the limitation of your senses, you misunderstand something to be something else and you fall into a state of illusion. So it's only because of Krishna. Now he doesn't force you to do that. He's, he's doing everything he can to convince you, give up sense gratification. And just surrender unto me. Sarva dharma pritya jamami kam saranam bhaja. Aham tvam sarva papi pya moksi syami masucha. He's asking you to give it up and, and just engage in devotional service and devotional service is explained in the fifth chapter and verse number, what is it, seven, where he says, Yoga Yukta Vijitatma, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Yoga Yukta Visudatma Vijitatma Jitendriya. Sarva bhutatma bhutatma kurvana pina lipyate. Very important verse. He says, one who works in devotion, who is a pure soul, and who controls his mind and senses is dear to everyone, and everyone is dear to him. Though always working, such a man is never entangled. So, this should be your verse. This verse is specifically for every one of you, like uh, Shritan and Shrestha and uh, Pavalika and uh, Agastya and Advitya and uh, Pavalika, uh, yes, Pavalika and Suniti and uh, everybody, every one of you. This is your verse. In fact, you should memorize this verse, read the purport. This is your homework for next week. And your homework is to write an essay based on this verse, 5, 7. And explain what you, what would be an ideal life for you. Now, all of you are young. You know, I think maybe the oldest is maybe 15 or 16. Everyone else is younger. So what would be your ideal life? Are you going to base it on this verse, 5, 7, or something else? Uh, so you write what you consider would be your ideal life. And uh, that means you have to know what the goal of life is that has to be discussed. You have to know how to attain that goal of life that has to be discussed, and you have to explain what you're going to achieve in the end. 
that has to be discussed, right? What is the goal of life and how to attain that goal and what you're going to actually achieve. As someone might say, well, the goal of my life is to be happy. And how are you going to achieve that? I'm going to make a lot of money and work in IT and AI. And what will be the end? I will uh, get a uh, many uh, congratulations for achievements that I've made and inventions that I've made and hard work that I've done, and that's it. Okay, well, <laughs> that's one opinion of what you want to do in the future. But uh, if you use this verse, now you don't have to. You can say, oh, well, wait a minute, I don't agree with Hari Vilas. Uh, I'm going to choose some other verse, you know, that is, uh, you can go to the 16th chapter and, and choose the verse that says, uh, it says, says, uh, 16th chapter, verses 11 and 12, I believe that to gratify the senses is a prime necessity of human civilization. Thus, until the end of life, I will have anxiety, in, and which will be immeasurable, bound up by a network of hundreds of thousands of desires absorbed in lust and anger. I will secure money, either legally or illegally, and use it only for sense gratification. Ah, well, that's another point of view, right? So, you know, choose your verses. I mean, I'm suggesting five, uh, seven. But if you might say, no, I don't like that verse. I, I learned 16, 11, and 12. Well, choose your verses and write what your goal in life, what you would like your goal in life to be, how you want to achieve that goal, and what will you actually uh, have as 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 proof that your 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 goal is the right goal. Okay, so thank you very much. Are there any questions? Now, I didn't cover too many homeworks today, but because uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm a little bit uh, uh, control uh, limited uh, every Sunday now, doing uh, this uh, conference call with other devotees that I know for many years about our experiences with Srila Prabhupada. I do that every Sunday now for, it'll go on for some time, uh, starting at 10.30. So I'll stop right there. But I think you're gonna have a fun homework, and, uh, and I wanna thank everyone that did their homework this, uh, for yesterday and today. Hare Krishna, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Hare Krishna. Hi. Ready? It's almost time.